He has made me glad. We have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be glad for, really, when we think about it all that we have read there. We, um, we don't need to go through all of that. We don't need to go through any of that. We just need to turn up here and worship the Lord. But that's not all there is to it, is it? We looked at that this morning. We looked at the implications of worship in our lives. We looked at the, the implications of knowing that He is God and He watches over us and keeps us and that He is our Lord and our Savior. Of course, that's uh, flippant to say things like that, to say that, oh, that is, that is just how it is. It's more of an in-depth thing. And, and here tonight we see that it's an in-depth thing for the priests that prepared and consecrated, were consecrated to go into the tabernacle. It had to be more. Why did it have to be more? Because they were going into the presence of God. That's no mean feat when we think about it. We're going into the presence of God when we enter His gates, when we, when we prepare ourselves to worship God, when we, when we set our lives before Him and set our lives down and say, You are Lord. Of course, very often we don't think of that. As Christians, we very often think, well, it's a good job I'm a Christian. It's a, good, it's a good thing that I am. But the Lord has chosen us, just like He chose Aaron and his sons. He's consecrated us through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. He set us apart to be his people, and He is our God. Of course, we forget those things. And very often, through the mundane days of life, we just plod on with what comes and what is before us. What I want us to look at this evening, though, is in, in the closing of this series that we've looked at, or this study of Exodus, I want us to look at the reflection of God's presence. I don't know whether you can remember all the way back, and I'm sorry if you're visiting, um, you, can, you can look online and see them. There is 47 um, sermons on Exodus. That's what we looked at over the last few months, 47 sermons. And as um, our good friend, uh, Reverend William McLeod said this morning, well, we've got a lot of bread out of Exodus, haven't we? We did, William. We got a lot of manna out of Exodus. It's been very interesting. It's been, it's been quite meticulous in different ways. But when you think about the subjects we've covered, they've all come under one heading, that if His presence isn't with us or go with us, then what is the point? Moses said it quite quaintly, didn't he? God, if you don't go with us, I'll stay here. I'll stay here. What did that mean for him? Well, it, it meant he would stay in the wilderness. It meant that he would suffer what he'd been going through and all that entailed with the Israelites because God wouldn't lead them. I wonder if we could say that about our lives. I wonder if we could say that tonight, that if God didn't go with us tomorrow morning when we wake up and do whatever we do, would we go? Would we still do it? 
Yes, we do the jobs that we have and we do the tasks that we have, but what about in worship to Him? Would we still do it? Here we see that there's a journey that is coming, a journey for the Israelites as the tabernacle becomes the place of worship, the place where God is present in this ramshackle of a tent that they've got to set up. Of course, we know it wasn't a ramshackle of a tent. It was precise and accurate. It was planned to the most finest of detail so that God could dwell in it. And that's what I want us to picture, that in our lives going forward, starting tonight, starting tomorrow, whenever you want to start it, apply to your lives that His presence would go with you. What would you put right then? What would you alter? What would you change? What would you make shinier? How would you set up your life tomorrow morning when you go into work and there's a problem and the quick and easiest way to deal with it is to just lose your temper and then it'll be sorted. No, oh, God doesn't want that, does He? He wants us to be right and proper. He wants us to be attentive to His Word. See, these are the things that we need to think through, and this is what God was implying to the, to the people of Israel, saying it's got to be done right. It's got to be done in a proper way. It's got to be consecrated as holy Otherwise, I won't go near it. When we look at the teaching that is involved in this particular book, we see that it points perfectly towards Christ. It shows us that the Christian teaching that we've adopted for ourselves, our doctrine, our, our, our spiritual values, our all of what we take as church has to be of similar merit. It has to be precise, and it has to be to the Word of God. I don't know whether you noticed on the back of the letter and the intimation sheet this morning there, I put 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, and it says this, for there shall be a person there shall be a season, sorry, when the sound teaching they will not suffer, but according to their own desires to themselves, they shall heap up teachers itching in the hearing. Another version puts it, they'll surround themselves with what they want to hear. You see, there's a place and there is an expression of how we worship and why we worship that has to be kept to. We can't just walk away from that because then what happens, as I alluded to in my prayer, the church, the church just goes the way of society. It starts being run by the world and not the church running so we delve into these we see a few areas that are worth looking at in fact it's all worth looking at but to keep you here only until about seven o'clock we only can pick a few things out and first I want us to look at the tabernacle and what it shows us about being God's dwelling place on earth. I've said before that Exodus 40 is our last chapter in the book of Exodus. 
And at the end of this, I just want to flick through some of the aspects that Exodus has taught us and how we apply it and, and implement those things to our own situation, our own lives. But in this particular chapter, we see that the fulfillment of God's instructions were taken to the letter. Moses, concerning the construction and the consecration of the tabernacle, he applied everything. It says there, and Moses did as God commanded. This tent of meeting was designed to be the dwelling place of God. It was designed so that His presence would be among His people in a tangible way, in a in nigh a touchable way. You know, we could say that our churches were once like that. There was a, an air of respect in communities. There was, a, there was a, an experience of awe when people met. Thankfully, we still have a Sunday where it's quiet, where there's not much on, and, and there is an, a respect within the communities. We, we have a house in Stoneaway which we let out, and some people, they automatically put the washing out on a Sunday. And it, it, you know, we go past and go, oh no, I don't know what the neighbors will think. I remember the last time that happened, it was actually somebody from the island that must have forgotten. The... But when we came back, I think that night, they, the washing was gone. <laughs> So, uh, somebody must have phoned them. It, certainly, it wasn't me, <laughs> but um, these things uh, we take for granted, don't we? On the mainland, it's just another day. Further afield, it's, it's actually a work day. It's, it's, you know, the, the UK law still has a little bit of that entangled in it, but further afield, it's, it's just any other day. And we wonder, don't we? We wonder why God seems to have lifted His hand off our church, our societies. When we see that Moses, through all of what was entangled in his, in his job, to say it that way, he carried out God's command. He knew this was the only way that Israel could go forward. And the tabernacle is, is a foreshadow, isn't it, of Christ. It reveals to us that Jesus Christ, who was the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that is the, the incredible and crucial part of our understanding as people of God, that Jesus Christ became Word, He became flesh, and He dwelt among us, and He still does. He still does because of the power of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus, you remember, said to His disciples, I will send. My promise is that I'll send Him to be with you. I'll not leave you alone. We quite often forget that we have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. In us today is that same power. In us today is the promised Holy Spirit. Is that not all enough for us? John 1 verse 14 says, In Christ God took on human form, becoming Emmanuel. I, I note on my 
John noted to me the other day, it's only 13 weeks and it's Christmas. And then we'll celebrate that God with us, Emmanuel. Just as God's presence filled the tabernacle then, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt bodily in Jesus. And if we therefore trust in Jesus and a claim to that promise that He has said will be, then today, folks, you and I, you and I have God in ourselves. That is no short for at all. It is something that we should cling on to and continue to remember. But of course, our church has been belittled through scandal, through schism, through whatever. It's been watered down in society. It's, been, it's become less affected or, a, or authoritative in our schools, in our councils, in our government, in, in, in our country. Can we do anything about that? Perhaps not, but God can. And I, I think we should never forget that, that God God comes into our midst to dwell amongst His people. And when we have the authority of the Word living with us and in us and through us, then we can speak into people's lives, we can speak into society's lives, and we can speak into the areas that make a difference. It doesn't happen overnight. But when, when we set up that tabernacle, God is in the midst. When we look at the two different areas, we see that there is a, an outer sense of God's living. Are we do we take hold of that or do we go to the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle? And that is where God's presence is most consecrated. Now, I'm not an expert on this and I don't make to be, but I believe in the time of revival that that presence was so touchable that people could not approach the church for want of repentance. If it's happened once, it can happen again. If God can do it in the midst of some, He can do it in the midst of others. There is no barrier that God cannot break through. We, we might put a few there, but there's no God, there's no barrier that God can just annihilate. When we look at the anointing of the tabernacle, we see that between 9 and 15 of that chapter, chapter 40, we read that the anointing of a tabernacle and its furnishings and the consecration of Aaron and its, his sons as priests, this act of anointing, it signifies the setting apart of these items and individuals for holy purpose. We are His church. We are Christ's own. We have been called by Him, chosen by Him, anointed by Him in the Holy Spirit. We're set apart and consecrated for Him. Whilst He was on His earthly ministry, he was empowered to fulfill his mission of salvation. 
And remember, as we saw this morning on the video for the children, we saw that the, the Godhead was it it was it was shown as being in that consecration, in that anointing. As Jesus went down into the water, when He came up, the dove came down being the Holy Spirit, and God said, this is My Son in whom I'm well pleased. As we trust in Christ, as we trust in Him, that same anointing, that same Godhead places us into the realms of consecration, set apart for this earthly ministry. That's a big challenge for some, and it's a, it's a hard challenge for others. And we very often we hear, I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't be like that. I, I, you, we, we have to realize that no matter how little, as I said this morning, how little the task or the job or the, the gift that we have, Christ, if Christ is glorified, if Christ is in it, you play a part. It might be a word, it might be a scripture, it might be a prayer, it might be just a simple task of giving somebody a bottle of water, it might be a numerous amount of things, but in that we are consecrated and set apart by the power of the Holy Spirit to do that ministry. Each and every one of us sitting here who trusts in the Lord Jesus tonight has that job. We might not realize it. We might not think we're capable of it. But He has called us. When we think about it, because we go in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bring glory to Him. The revelation that we see in this passage and particularly in verse 34 to 38, is that, that when the cloud and the glory of the Lord was present, the people wanted to stay there. They wanted to be in the realms of their God. And God, let's not forget, God wanted to be in the realms of His people. Otherwise, in all in all, He would not have said, make a tabernacle so I can dwell in your midst. And He says the same to us tonight, that He wants to dwell in our midst. He wants to be present in all that we do, even if it's the minuscule elements of life. He wants to, he wants to give us that because He wants the Lord Jesus to be glorified. He's empowered each and every one of us to serve in His kingdom. And when the cloud came down and it was in their midst, by day it was showing that His presence was there. By night it was the light that came into the darkness, and again, it fulfilled that His presence was there. I don't know about you, whether you ever think about these things, and you, whether you, you, you contemplate them ever happening in our lifetime. I mean, it would be something if there was a cloud. What am I saying? There's always a cloud over above us. But no, what if it was the cloud of the presence of God over above us? And at night, the fire was in that cloud. It would be something to behold. And it would be something that not only warmed our hearts, but warmed the hearts of others 
We might even say more folk respecting God's presence. When we compare this to what Jesus did, when He was present in the crowds, people amassed around Him. They wanted more of Him. They wanted everything about Him. They wanted to listen to Him, to hear Him. They wanted them a touch of Him. It's a symbol that He was anointed, consecrated, and given a ministry on this earth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't till the Holy Spirit indwelled in him as a man that his ministry came about. How do we bring this wonderful book to an end? Well, I think there's one thing that we need to remember and conclude from what we've looked at tonight, that His presence in our midst is essential. It is a must. It is something we should be praying for again and again. Lord, bring Your Spirit. Bring Your presence. Dwell in the midst of your people. I'm not asking us to set tabernacles up, but I am asking us to recognize that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And as Christians, like 1 Corinthians 6, 19 points out, we are that temple that the Holy Spirit indwells in. We are Christ's tabernacle His dwelling place here on earth, and we give glory to Him for that. Nothing we do, but all that He. Now, I said I would uh, show us a little bit about what Exodus has taught us, and I tried to uh, put it together in such a way that we would see an understanding of the different aspects. And so quickly I'll run through them by showing that firstly we looked at God's faithfulness. And the book of Exodus shows that God is a faithful God who, when He makes a promise to deliver His people from bondage, He does it. No matter all the obstacles that came up against the people of Israel, He overcame them through His servant Moses. He was faithful, and He is faithful to His church. At the moment, it might not look like it is, and we might ask bewildering questions, but He will deliver His church from the sin through an eternal life in Christ Jesus. Secondly, then, there was the notice of it being a covenant relationship. The covenant highlights the importance of our obedience and living in a covenant relationship with God for today's church is is a must. It is something that we must continue to stand upon. That through Christ Jesus, we have a relationship with God. And that can never be broken. It can never be, we can never be torn apart from Him. That is His covenant promise. Thirdly then, the worship and God's presence. The tabernacle, that, that emphasized, I suppose, the significance of worship and of God's dwelling among His people. Today, the church is a place where God's presence is encountered through worship and fellowship. I think over COVID, that 
has affected many people in different ways, and it has affected an outlook for the church that has changed different aspects. But to encounter God's presence together as one in the Spirit is still, for me, the way that God wants us to live our lives. It showed also leadership is a must. It is imperative for our churches that leadership and the reliance on God's guidance should serve as the model for the church, and that we must seek God's direction and intercede for the people. And that is one of the reasons why I've intimated that the women of our church, the women of the West Side, have come together in prayer. Because intercessory prayer is a must in our day and age. And I I pray that the Lord will bless that time with more and more as indeed it develops. Lastly, and not for the sake of of just putting it there, but redemption. You would say that the crucial part of Exodus is the Passover and the crossing of the Red Sea. It's a central aspect of our gospel message that Christ, through His blood, has saved us from our sin. He's made us, as we read this morning, as white Our our, our coverings, our our clothes have been washed clean on that day when we'll encounter Jesus in eternity. If it was not for Christ's redemption on humanity, we would be lost forever wandering in the wilderness like the Israelites. So it's through His sacrificial death and His resurrection that we now have that right relationship if we trust in Him. I don't know about you, but I, I have loved Exodus. It's been probably one of my most enjoyable studies. Um, and uh, I hope that Revelation, as we look at that and start on it uh, as soon as possible, will become as instructive as um, important to us, and I hope that it will it'll show us the way forward for the church today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know many of you have commented, more so commented than any time before, how indeed it has given us much bread, much manna, much thought, and much insight into who Christ is. And I think that's the central point that we need, that if Christ lives in us, we have God's presence. Imagine we have God's presence in us. Surely, surely that is a good thing. If it's not See me afterwards. But let's praise God that He's blessed our time together in this book. Let's pray before we sing our last item. God and Father, we thank You that as we've looked at the book of Exodus, You have unraveled some of the misunderstandings that we take on board and given us a greater understanding that Your presence goes with us that Your presence is central to us as believers of Christ. And Lord, we ask that indeed You would empower us more and more to realize that and take, take, Lord God, Your presence into our every situation, into our families, into our work situations, into our schools, into our community. Lord, take it 
into every area, our finance, Lord, in our, in, into our, our understanding of how life works. And Lord, reveal Your Son to us through the power of Your Holy Spirit. We ask it in His name, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to sing a well-known song to all of us, I'm sure. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. remember our prayer meeting on Wednesday, 7.30. It's uh, in person or on Zoom, and if you want the details about that, please let me know. You're all welcome to come along if you are able to. Let's say the benediction in closing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.